So mysteries are one of those uh, tricky words to define. But you know it when you're mystified by something and then an expert comes along and demystifies it for you, right? I remember a quote by Albert Einstein, and he said, if you can't explain something simply, you don't understand it well enough. And he's the one that came up with E equals MC squared. <laughs> so taking the law of the universe and breaking it down into one tiny little equation. So that's an example, right? And the ways of God, it says in, in the book of Romans, are the, the, in the King James, it uses the word inscrutable. Anybody remember that one? Hard to understand, beyond our comprehension. Not that they couldn't be understood, but for the average person, it's beyond our comprehension. And that's what I wanted to just talk about a little bit today, because Jesus is so good. He's smarter than Einstein, right? He knew E equals MC squared before Einstein figured it out. It's not that it was, uh, he didn't, Einstein didn't create it. He discovered something that was already there. And have you noticed that about your walk with the Lord? That the longer you serve him and the deeper your relationship gets with him, that he reveals more mysteries to you today than he did when you were newly saved? I hope that's true, because that's a sign that you're growing. And you can never grow so much that every single thing will ever be revealed, and that should excite you. It can, it can discourage us in some ways because we're, we're built, we're wired in such a way that we like to know that there's an end. I get to graduate with a degree that says X, Y, Z, right? But you don't with the kingdom of God because there's another level. However far you've gone, there's another level you can go. And I find that to be very exciting because we don't ever, ever have to be bored as Christians. Um, but, you know, the, the religious spirit works against that idea of wanting to climb higher into God. See, this picture is just so powerful. I'll leave it up there for a minute. It's like religion will get you to a point where you think you're okay and that you don't have to go any further. But, but relationship says, no, sin separated me from the Father in the garden, way back in the Garden of Eden. But now Jesus has reconciled me back to the Father. But just because we've been reconciled back to the Father doesn't mean we're walking in the fullness of a relationship with the Father. What does that look like? Well, it looks different for everybody, but it's certainly a level of intimacy where you feel very comfortable going to your Father and asking him, questions when you're not sure what needs to be done, right? But many people don't feel that way about God because religion has clamped them down and said, you haven't earned that right. And it's all about working your way into his favor. But when you have a relationship with the Father, you know you have favor with him. Linnell stood up here and talked about this promotion, but she's worked her way into understanding this isn't a fluke. He loves me. This is what he wants for me. And it's really a big, important shift that's part of the mystery of the kingdom is why does he love me so much when I don't deserve it? We sang it, right? I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, he gives himself away. Well, the answer is because of love. Love is the reconciling force. Sin separated us. Love reconciled us back. And for the rest of our lives, hopefully, we'll be gaining deeper and deeper levels of knowledge of this intimate relationship with a father. We're not orphans anymore. We're adopted sons and daughters of a living God. Your name is written in the will. Fully accepted. So Jesus example, set an example for us of somebody. I use the word fluent because we can understand language as something to be fluent about. I don't speak Spanish, right? I can't even say un poco. I don't even say that right. <laughs> but there's people here that were raised uh, where Spanish was their first language, and they had to learn English. And during that process of learning, you go through having to interpret. If you, if you grew up with Spanish, you have to interpret from Spanish into English. But when you become fluent, you don't have to interpret anymore because you can think in English and you can think in Spanish. And for someone who doesn't know two languages, it's, I can only imagine what that would be like. But Jesus, when he was here, he thought in heavenly kingdom, but lived in earthly kingdom. So he was able to translate immediately in real time what the Father was saying in heaven into the earth and speak it out. And that's why he said, I only say what I hear the Father saying. Wouldn't it be nice if we could all say that? 
that we lived in that kind of reality that I'm so, my bandwidth between heaven and earth is so strong that I don't say anything unless I first hear the Father say it. And then I'm just repeating what he tells me to say. Anybody there yet? Want to get there? Raise your hand. We want to get there. So that's this process of the mystery of the kingdom is that uh, we feel limited as human beings, but God is unlimited. But you can ask him to take the limit off today in my re revelatory understanding. I want to understand more of what you have to say. And I'm going to talk about parables because our text verse came out of Mark chapter 4. It says, when he was alone, the 12 came and asked him about what? The parable. And you can imagine, these were mostly blue-collar men that were surrounding Jesus. They weren't highly educated, and Jesus spoke in parables often, and they didn't fully understand what he was talking about. And, and he was saying, like, why, they were saying, why do you make it so hard? Why do you have to speak this way? And I'm going to unpack that. I'm going to try to unpack. A parable is a story, and para means to come alongside. You throw a story down alongside something to help people understand and unpack that truth. And it's a brilliant way that Jesus taught us how to communicate, but he was just giving them what the Father was giving him. All right, so let's think of an example. Uh, I, I, I said this already, but I'll read it again. It said, there'll always be more to know about the Father God. So that's part of the mystery, is that we're on a search. The longer we're saved, the longer we know him, we stay on a search to say, I want to know you more. I want to be hungry for you. And, and the more things strip away that we lose appeal for the world, the more we gain that hunger for God. And Jesus, when he spoke to the woman at the well, do you remember he said, if you drink the water I give you, what? You'll never thirst for that water again because now I'm going to be your source. You know, I realize I have a wireless mic on. Should I try it? Okay. Should I try it? Is it working? Okay. Hey, better late than never. I figured it out. <laughs> So they say they're confused about this parable, and that means that the, when he speaks to us, he speaks in symbols, and we don't always fully get it the first time he speaks to us, right? But if you keep pressing in and asking him to show you and reveal to you more, that's what he loves. He loves that hungry heart. I mean, even Bruce Springsteen sang a song called Everybody Has a Hungry Heart. <laughs> I'm dating myself now, right? But it's true. We do. But what are we hungry for? Is it for the world or for the mysteries of God? Let's just get ourselves to the place where, Lord, every day when we wake up, like I said, sorry to repeat myself, but my wife and I have gotten in the habit of taking communion in the morning and letting that wafer be the first thing that we eat because it sets you into a priority that I want you first over everything else I'm going to be shown today. I don't mean to make it a religious exercise. That's actually the opposite of what I want to convey is that, no, whatever you have to do to discipline yourself, to get in the word early, to make your, the beginning of your day the Lord, not that he's an afterthought that pops into your head at 2 o'clock, oh, yeah, I have to do my devotionals. You know, that's, that's not a good sign of a healthy relationship with God. When you love somebody and you're in love with them, you want to be with them. And you don't typically go from not having a real vibrant relationship to an instantly vibrant relationship, you grow into that. So don't shame yourself. No matter where you are today isn't the issue. Is can you be 1% better a week from now, 2% better, whatever better means for you. It's not a formula. So a lot of times we feel limited. Anybody under, uh, hear the term G-force before? Do I have any Air, Air Force people in here? So the, the pilots, when they get into the jet fighters, they're limited by something called the G-force because how many have been on one of those uh, rides, uh, uh, Seaside Heights, roller coaster? You know what a G-force is when you hit that bottom and it takes you up to the top and you have that feeling. It's like, whoa, and it pulls you back. So we've actually come up with jets that can go faster than the pilots can fly them because if the pilots pull off a turn at a certain speed, the G-force is so strong it'll knock them out. And why am I saying that? What's, how is that relative to this? Is that sometimes the knowledge of God feels that way to us. That we, it's like a circuit breaker goes off because we try to understand something, but the circuit breaker goes off and we just can't understand it. And he, uh, he said, we live in Deuteronomy 8.3. Man lives by every word that what? 
See the, the action word there? It proceeds, it continues to proceed out of his mouth. We live by that. That's our food. Jesus said it too. My food is to do the will of the one who sent me. It's not the natural food that we eat. And then uh, in this parable that they were asking him about happened to be the parable of the sower. He said, the seed sown on rich soil are those who hear the message, accept it, bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. So that's a really good picture for us, isn't it? This is what a healthy relationship with God looks like, is that we bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. Now, what kind of fruit do we want? Say good fruit. Because we know he talked about bad fruit too. And he said, bad fruit cannot come from a good tree, right? So, so much of it goes back to what's in the root system because the tree is going to produce fruit. It's just going to either be good or bad based on what's in the roots. So this point about staying hungry, as I said, it's very different for each one of us because we all have different wiring, different temperaments, different ways that we get excited about something. Your friend could come up to you and say, oh, I heard this great song. I'm going to send it to you. And you get it, and it, like, didn't do much for me. And you don't want to hurt their feelings, but, like, our taste in music is different. doesn't mean they were wrong. It's just that you have a different wavelength that you're on when it comes to music. And God can be that way, too. Like, what gets somebody else lit up might not excite you, but you need to find the thing that excites you. And that's just another part of the mystery of God. So the G-force is an example. I, I gave you this slide. This is the guy that absorb the most g-force without dying. Zero gravity when they're in, in space, right? The astronauts are in space. That's zero. One is here. Five is like a race car, you know, one of those drag racers. He survived 82 <laughs> just for less than a second, 0.04 seconds. But he was very close to death. And sometimes that's how we feel in the kingdom, right? That's, that's the, the force of God is so strong it's, Isaiah said, when I saw the Lord, I fell down as if I was a dead man. <laughs> and over and over, when the angels appear to people in the Bible, they say, fear not, <laughs> because it's scary to see one of these supernatural beings. Here's the picture I want, why I, I gave you that analogy. Let's just have a hypothetical for a minute and say, everybody here is a guitar player. And we're in, we're in a class, like a seminar, on how to improve our skill. If we're honest, there's no two people who would be exactly at the same skill level. You know, if they had a way to measure what your skill level was, none of us would be there, what that guy just did. Let's say he's a 10. But all of us would fall somewhere below that, right? And if you're not below that, how come you're not on the worship team is what I want to know. <laughs> My little pitch. But what if the teacher was so strong that... They gave one lesson, and every one of us walked away with, uh, from that meeting at a higher level than when we walked in. That's the mystery of the kingdom of God, is that each one of us can see Jesus above us with his hand out to us trying to pull us to a higher level. And that would take a real genius, wouldn't it? Because typically, whatever the teacher did, some of the people in the room would feel lost and some would say, oh, that's really good. And others would say, oh, that's too basic. I already know that. But when Jesus speaks, it's this universal teaching that every one of us gets something out of. And he wants us to be that to other people. You can say, wow, you're trying to compare yourself to God. Well, he was the one that compared us to him. He said, greater things than these will you do. I'm back to holding the mic again. What's wrong with me? <laughs> I, I literally dropped the mic. <laughs> I had a chance to be with Perry. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time with he and his wife, Wanda. We hope to have them back, and we also hope to have the other couple back from South Africa. The machine gun prophet. She could go for 15 minutes without taking a breath, giving prophetic words to people. It was amazing, wasn't it? And like she wasn't speaking slowly as she was speaking. There was a lot of content in there. So we'll have them back. But the thing about Perry that was so, you know, he was just as real as what you saw, just relaxed as in person as, as he was when he was speaking. But there was a couple things he didn't get to in the message that we had spoken about uh, while we were just lounging. 
And, you know, he's so into it because he's writing this book on this, The Extravagant Nature of God. I don't know if that's the title, but this really stuck out to me. He spoke, when he was here, he did speak about the nets breaking. Remember, he spoke from Luke when they had been fishing all night and Jesus said, cast the net on the other side and there were so many fish, the nets were breaking, right? But then I put in this part, it says, we all, he also spoke, he and I, about how God's ways are hard for us to translate. So remember, in the boat, Peter said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. And that wasn't something he made here, but he made it to me. He's like, why do we do that to God? This amazing blessing came, and the first reaction that Peter had was, you're holy, and I'm not, and I can't be in your presence. You see the G-force thing? That you get into a situation that's so hard for you to understand at a circuit breaker goes off in your brain and you just say, I can't be with you right now because I don't understand what's going on. And God's saying, no, push through. Push through what you don't understand because trying to understand everything can actually be a pretty big negative. It could be linked to our pride. It could be linked to having to know everything and I'm not going to move forward unless I know everything. But if his ways are high above our ways, you're not going to know everything. Many times in the Bible, he would only give partial instructions to people. He said that to Philip, go down to the road. And Philip went, not knowing. And then he saw this eunuch sitting in a chariot, and now God said, go over to the chariot. But he didn't tell him what he was going to do when he got there. Philip was just obedient, went, and now all of a sudden he sees this man reading. So we have to be that way too. It takes a lot of courage, doesn't it? But it also takes really knowing how to discern the voice of the Lord from your own voice and from the soulish realm. And that's why spending more time in the Word and more time in prayer and more time together with other believers who will help encourage you and push you and act like that guy when you're trying to play the guitar and say, wow, if that's where the bar is set, that's really exciting because there's a lot further I can go in this in the Lord. And then he and I talked about it personally too because similar to Peter in the boat saying, Lord, depart from me, I'm a sinful man, was the people when they came across the lake after the storm and they met the demoniac, remember? And all of a sudden, Jesus cast out the legion of demons that were in him. And it says in the Bible that he was in his right mind. And when the people of the region saw him, they asked Jesus to leave. Why would they do that? Shouldn't they have emptied out the psych ward and said, Lord, if you could do it for that guy, then all these other people can be healed too, right? But they couldn't grasp what was happening. It was too big of a shift. And the first thing they said is leave because our pigs are dead. (laughs) Selah. (laughs) Right? Sometimes we want to hold on to our pigs. Look what it says. The people of the Gerasene district asked him to leave for they had been seized with great fear. It was too unusual. It was too out of the ordinary. And what I'm saying is we're, pre- we're praying, God, move among us. We sang it this morning. You're still doing miracles. You're still taking down mountains. Demons are still being cast out of people. We do not have to be bound by the afflictions of this world. They're light and momentary afflictions is what Paul said, right? So when you read the parables, and that's really, again, back to the beginning of this, is that that's how the parables felt to the apostles sometimes. Jesus would tell a story And then it was really hard for them to understand, so they just kind of checked out until they got to him later, and they said, can you explain to us what the parable means? And when it comes to the sower, I'm guessing most of you here know about the sower with the seeds, right? And there were four different kinds of soil, and that's representative of our heart. And the first fell on the road, and obviously it had nowhere to go in. The second fell among the rocky soil. The third fell among the weeds. And then the fourth fell on good ground. And then he translated that for them and said, no, it's a hard heart. It's somebody who's bound by the things of the world, the, the, the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches. We're the weeds. We're in a very high-level first world country, aren't we? So we could easily fall victim to the deceitfulness of riches in our culture. When Trish and I were in uh, Africa, in Mozambique, that was not one of their main problems. They were not in in being caught up in the deceitfulness of riches. They were very, very poor. It was a third world country like I had never seen before. They were just wondering about next meals kind of thing. They were not caught up in the deceitfulness of riches, but they had a different battle that they were facing. 
So we have to recognize what our territorial spirits are and recognize that comfort could almost be our biggest enemy as much as it's such a blessing. When it comes to being hungry for God, the comfort of our flesh, we don't want to give up our pigs. See what I'm saying? And I'm not trying to get too hard on you here because it's all of us. So he told this to the Pharisees. Matthew 21, 28. A man had two sons. He went to the first one and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I don't want to. But later he changed his mind and went. And then verse 30. The father went to his other son and said the same thing. And this one said, I will go work in the field, sir. But he didn't go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they replied. That's right, Yeshua said to him. I tell you that the tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. <laughs> Come again, Jesus? We're the Pharisees. We like our pigs. You get the point? Like, we're leaning on our understanding because that's been our value structure our whole lives. We've always been valued by other people because we could outsmart them, literally. We know the scriptures better than they do. But most people in that day couldn't even go to school. Most people didn't know how to read. The 12 disciples that he picked were not college grads. They weren't seminary grads. They were blue-collar people. Does that seem odd to anybody? That he would pick blue-collar people? Why? Because the kingdom of God is for everybody. And that's what he's saying. These prostitutes and tax collectors are getting it before you. And you're the Pharisees and you know the law. You should be getting it before them. But the intellect has become a, an idol. And that's another thing that we face in our culture, is that we're not humbled by the word of God. We look at it and read it and say, well, we know what that means. And there's nothing more for me to know. But to you, it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. All your life. You ever wonder why? Anybody been safe here more than 20 years? Yeah, a lot of people have put their hands up. You can read something you read now today that you read 20 years ago and you get something brand new out of that. The word didn't change. You changed. You grew. Life did a number on you too, right? Good and bad. But you're a different person today than when you read it 20 years ago and you're seeing it through a different lens and it's so powerful and alive that it gives you a whole new form of nourishment now than what you got the first time. That's not unusual. Children can get a basic understanding, like if you're teaching them how to go fishing, when they're 10 years old. But now at 20, they get a whole new grasp of that process. And that's how God wants us to be. And he wants us to be so good that we're as good as that guy playing the guitar when it comes to knowing how to translate between heaven and earth. And if you just think of that picture, he was not striving, was he? He looked bored. He wasn't bored. He liked what he was doing. But he just had his eyes closed and he was leaning back. And he was so, so familiar with that guitar in his lap because that's all he had ever done his whole life that he could hear something and translate it instantly into his fingers on both hands. Super complicated. But the dexterity came because of his level of understanding of what he was doing. And when you spend time in the Word, it's going to return. It's going to give you a positive dividend on that. It's going to help you make better decisions. The Bible in, in, in the Psalms, it says it makes wise the simple. The law of the Lord is perfect. It's complete. And it takes a simple person and makes them wise. Simple doesn't mean in, uh, ignorant. It just means uninformed. But you don't need to be informed in all the details to make good decisions. So all the degrees can become chains around us of logic and reasoning, and I have degrees, I don't want to be that person that says you shouldn't get an education, but it always has to be subservient to the will of God. That is the servant. He is the leader. Far above us, his ways are far above our ways, and we're in a really like stronghold in the New York region of this intellectual version of Christianity that is trying to normalize sin, right? And wants you to think, Oh, no, that was the people in the old days thought that, but you can read the Bible this way, and it's basically anything goes. And that's not what it says. And the church has always read it the same way. It's not going to change now, but people would love it to change, like some kind of decaffeinated version. It's not going to be decaf. <laughs> so that's a little bit of a wake-up call. If Jesus says to the 
Pharisees, who are the leaders of the church, they, we, they wouldn't have called it the church, they would have called it the synagogue, but it was still the Father's business in the earth. The priests, many of them became Christians. You know that, right? Yeah. The church in Jerusalem in the early days was made up of converted Jews. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Yeah. Paul was a Pharisee. Yeah. So they weren't completely lost. They took the word that was in them already, and I'll have to move my microphone here, but they took this book that they knew so well, and now they had to shift their thinking and look at it through another lens. It's back to my picture again. You see, Jesus was just like reaching, reaching down to them. Here's the Apostle Paul who served under Gamaliel, who had all the head knowledge, but Jesus said, you know what, I want to take you up to another level now. And I'm going to give you a different lens to look at the word through. And, and every one of us here should say, yes, Father, do that for me. Because no matter how long I've been saved, I want to look at it in a fresh lens. I want to see it new. And if he said to you, the prostitutes, I'll quote it directly, the tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. That's a very strong warning that you're doing some of it right. You know the word, but you're not teaching it properly. You're, you're using the lens of the word to filter people out. And I want you to filter people in. You think you're better than they are because you know the word. I want you to realize that because you know the word, you now have a duty to serve them. And to look at everybody equally. And they didn't do that. And that's what religion does. It starts to pull rank on, on other people. And he does it again. Jesus said to them, same chapter, verse 42. Have you ever read the scripture that says, the very stone the builders rejected as flawed has now become the most important capstone of the arch? Who would that be? Jesus, Jesus is the capstone. He was rejected by the Jews. His, his teaching was too radical. There were two different groups of people. One thought he should have been like David that was going to come in and overthrow the Roman army with force. Another thought that, what's in it for me? And he was saying, you have to sacrifice. And they didn't like that idea. And then there was a political angle too, like if the Romans find out about what we're trying to do, they're going to kill us, and we can't risk that. And isn't it ironic that without ever lifting a weapon, he took over the whole empire a few hundred years after his death, Christianity was the official religion of the Roman Empire. It was twisted. I, I grant you that. It was twisted by Constantine. But it was so strong, it defeated every army that tried to resist him. And that should, give you, that should really give you a lot of hope. Right? So yeah, the, the cornerstone, capstone, was rejected. This was the Lord's plan. Isn't it a miracle for our eyes to behold this is why I say to you that the kingdom of God, this is what he's saying to the Pharisees now, okay? The kingdom of God, realm, kingdom realm of God will be taken from you and given to a people who will bear its fruit. How many here want to bear the fruit of the kingdom? I try to ask easy questions. So that's good. That was an easy one. We all want to bear the fruit. The Pharisees took the angle, we're going to get more knowledge, but they weren't bearing fruit. What if you could have the knowledge and bear the fruit? And many of them did. Like I said, Nicodemus and Paul are two good examples of early Pharisees that made the shift. They were converted. They had the knowledge, but they humbled themselves. And Paul said, all those things that I used to count as so important, I now count as lost, lost that I may know him. Yeah. Hmm. All of us should feel that way. Amen? Amen. All right. That's the mystery of the kingdom. Oh, I'll, I'll finish that. The ones who comes against this... Oh, sorry. The one who comes against this stone will be broken, but the one on whom it falls will be pulverized. Remember that one? You can either fall on the rock or the rock will fall on you. If you fall on the rock, you get humbled. Anybody here need to be humbled? Come on. It's another easy question. Raise your hand. I'm not going to keep going. Okay, good. You all know this, right? No matter how humble you think you are, you can't be proud of how humble you are. Because that proves you're not humble, right? So it's this cycle that keeps going. There's always going to be a little bit left in there that can still keep getting flushed out. So that's what he's saying. The one who comes against this stone will be broken. So if you, if you bump up against Jesus, you will be humbled. But it's much better to fall on the rock than to have the rock fall on you. And that's what he's saying. The kingdom is going to be taken from you. That's a terrible thing for them to hear. 
The kingdom realm of God will be taken from you and given to a people who will bear fruit. And that should get us excited because all of us qualify to be able to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. I can't get into your world. I don't know who you know. I'm not touching the same people you're touching. I couldn't speak the language that you speak. You probably couldn't go on Wall Street with me and speak that language. Maybe you could, but most of you couldn't. It's not bad. You're just not familiar with that. So why do we have to try to compete against each other? Let's be good where we are. Let's know the fluency of that language, but also about yourself. Because that's the other thing. We compare ourselves to other people who have a different mix of gifts than we have. And we shouldn't do that. It only leads to shame because they're wired differently than you. And God doesn't want you to be them. He wants you to be you. So as a good father, he's going to speak life into you and to be rich fetch. And there's only one. I can't be him. And he shouldn't want to be me. But I should be blessed by our relationship. And he should be blessed by mine, even though we're different. Our makeup and our wiring is different. I'm very different than my wife, as if I had to tell you. But if we're, if we're smart and we make it work together, it's a huge compliment that we're so different that we can complete a whole array of gifts and then respect each other and say, well, this is what I'm thinking, but I know your track record in that area is really good. So I've learned that I can trust you in that, and we're going to go with that. And man, 30, how many, 30 plus years later, it took me a while, but I finally figured it out. She's coming a little bit on my side too, once in a while. She'll throw me a crumb. No. No, that's not true. More than a crumb. You have to do this. You, you, instead of grinding over the thing that bothers you about the other person, it doesn't have to just be a marriage. could be your boss. Instead of grinding over the thing that bothers you because they're not like you, ask the Lord, show me what's redemptive about that gift. And let me pull from it the strength that's in there. Because there is strength. Even though they're annoying you, part of why they're annoying you is because you know they're right about something. Mostly wrong. But right about something. You ever hear the expression, you throw a rock at a pack of dogs, and the one that yelps is the one that got hit. <laughs> right? So sometimes somebody will say something to you, and Ten other dogs didn't get hit, but the one that got hit in you was like barking, man. Like, because you know there was a moment of truth in there, and he wants you to deal with it. So these Pharisees had a choice. It's the same thing. The kingdom's going to be taken away from you. There's a whole new dispensation now. Jesus is saying, I'm about to die and get resurrected, and there's going to be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and you can't sit behind your logic and your reasoning and your knowledge. You're going to have to step into the gifts of the Spirit. If you choose to, you will be fully equipped because you know the word so well. But you're going to have to have a G-force that's going to knock you out. And that's the best G-force. That's the God force. Not the guitar force or the gravity force. It's the God force. That knocks Paul down on the road to Damascus and says, Why do you keep on persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? The, I'm Jesus, the one that you've been persecuting. He was blind. And sitting, you know, broken, this man of high stature was blind until some really brave guy comes along and says, you know what? God loves you. I don't know why, but he loves you. And he told me to pray for you that you're going to be healed. Remember Ananias? How brave was that guy? The Lord spoke to him and said, I want you to go over to a street called Straight and you're going to find this man. And Ananias like, Lord, you're sure you got the right guy? Because, uh, like, he's been killing us. I don't think I'm ready to die yet. This is not a death wish, is it? And God's like, no, you're going to pray for him because I'm going to reveal to him. Do you remember what he said? The things he's going to have to suffer on my behalf. Those pigs don't want to die. But look at how God used this man, Paul, and Ananias. That took a lot of courage to risk his life like that. Okay, so Matthew 11:25. Um, we can put ourselves in this one. It says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you concealed these things from the sophisticated and educated and revealed them to ordinary folks. How many ordinary folks we got? <laughs> Aren't you glad? You didn't need a PhD in order to uh, qualify to become a Christian? Yeah, thank God. You know, and it's really ironic, but when you get a master's degree in theology, it's called an MDiv. Anybody know what 
the doctor it's called? A demon. <laughs> Sounds kind of close to demon. It's a doctor and minister. Couldn't they come up with a better name than that than demon? But look, be careful. That's all I'm saying. Just be careful. I'm not against education. But uh, he kept it from the sophisticated people and revealed it to the ordinary folks. And then in Timothy, it says, I'm deeply grateful. Who's speaking now? This is Paul. Okay? I'm deeply grateful to our Lord for trusting me enough to appoint me his minister, despite the fact that I had previously blasphemed his name. That's a man who fell on the rock. He was humbled. I had previously blasphemed his name, persecuted his church, and damaged his cause. I believe he was merciful to me. Can we say that? We should all say this out loud together. I believe he was merciful to me because what I did was done in the ignorance of a man without faith. See, he had lots of knowledge, but no faith. He didn't understand relationship with God. He didn't understand God as a father. He was an orphan trying to earn his way into the love of God. I don't even know if they would have called it love. And they said you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but it was more so you wouldn't be punished. It's what religion does. And God say, no, pull back the veil and come in and spend time with me as a father. Fall in love with me. Love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You can't if you're worried that you're going to get pounced on and get beaten by your father. You need to see him as a loving father who wants you to grow. That picture of Jesus just reaching down and pulling you up. Have you heard the term scaffolding? Ever hear me talk about that? Yes. It's a learning technique that teachers learn sometimes. And, and what they tell the teachers is picture a building that's got 10 floors on it. And it's got scaffolding on the outside, right? And the construction workers are going up and down on the outside of the building on the scaffolding. Suppose there was somebody on the eighth floor that had to pass a tool down to somebody on the second floor. And it was, let's say, a power drill. Would they drop it from the eighth floor? Why not? Because they'd kill the guy on the second floor, right? What would they have to do? You're either going to ask the guy underneath on the second floor to climb up to you, or you're going to walk down to them. And this is the beauty of a brilliant teacher. They can meet you right where you're at. They can size up where you are and give you the exact tool you need to get you from where you are to the next level. That's why that picture is so powerful, because he's reaching down to you. You're at one place. I'm at a different place. But he's reaching down to both of us right where we are to take us up another level. And sometimes something else has to die in order for us to move higher. If you want to go up in a hot air balloon, they get rid of stuff. They drop off the weights, and they turn up the heat, and they go higher. Same with us. We've got to evict some of that old baggage, right? All right, so I'm, I'm almost done. So there's this last parable that he uses, and parables are like this, but they're multifaceted. That's the beauty. So I'll just give you an overview of a different parable just quickly to make the point. So you're with Jesus, and it's Luke chapter 15. It's verse 1, and it says that Jesus was hanging out with tax collectors and sinners, Okay. So let's just say they're over here. The tax collectors and sinners are over here. Over on this side was another group of people called the Pharisees. And they were looking at Jesus with the tax collectors and sinners. And what were they thinking? What a lowlife loser Jesus is. I can't believe we're here, the high and mighty people, the knowledgeable people, and he's hanging out with those lowlifes. And now these people are over here going, boy, Jesus is pretty cool. Those religious people are over there, but he wants to be with us. And if you look at the language, it's even better than that because it says the tax collectors and sinners were drawn to Jesus. Never says they were drawn to the Pharisees because religion doesn't draw people. It shames people. But relationship has a way of loving the sinner without condoning the sin. You can still hate the sin, but love the sinner. These religious folks just couldn't do it. They didn't know how to do that. Now Jesus is over here, and he decides to tell a parable. And it's a complex one. And it's like a funnel. I heard Eugene Peterson teach it this way. He said it's like a funnel. He tells a story, and the first one is, a man has 100 sheep, he loses one, and he leaves the 99 and goes to find the one. When he comes back, he throws a party. Then a woman has 10 coins. See how the funnel's coming down? 100 to 1, now 10 to 1. 
has 10 coins, loses one, sweeps the house, finds it, and, and does what? Throw a party. Comes down. A man has two sons. Loses one, right? He, the prodigal son left and he spent all the money. Loses one, finds him, and then throws a party. But then there's two brothers out of the two. The one that was found, but then there's the older brother. And he's not happy that, that dad's throwing a party, is he? No. Why not? He didn't earn it. The younger brother didn't earn it. And I did. So why are you throwing him a party and not me? Now look at the brilliance of this story. So here's Jesus. He knows that these are the people that they should be coming and approaching. He's modeling to the Pharisees what God wants is to hang out with the poor and the broken and the tax collectors and sinners. He said to them in a whole different place, these people are getting into the kingdom before you. How hard is that for them to grasp? How could that be? Not hard for us to grasp in the New Testament, though, is it? We can understand that. But he not only loves the broken, he loves the Pharisees. But they have armor on. Their knowledge is like armor. So he has to find a brilliant lock combination. How do I get behind the armor of their intellect? I could tell a story, and I could show them, ultimately, that they're the older brother who's standing outside while the father throws a party for the outcasts. But he never had to say that, did he? No. So he walks away, and the Pharisee's going, hey, wait a minute, he was talking about us. But he's already gone. See, but now what you do with that is up to you. And that's where conviction comes in. So when the Lord shows you something that you need to change, don't run from it. It's an act of love. Because none of us are perfect. He wants us to keep moving higher. He's got that arm out saying, come on. It's been given to you to know the mystery of God is that there's always going to be more to know about the Father. And I want to take you higher. You're never going to arrive where there's not more that you can know. And it, it's going to show in the way you live your life. You look like you're losing your attention span, so I'm going to go a little faster. So Matthew 21 tells another parable. You probably know this one too. It says a king throws a, a wedding feast for his son, and he invites all the wealthy people in the area. Only in verse 5 it says, the invited guests were not impressed. <laughs> one was preoccupied with his business, another went off to farming, and the rest seized the king's messengers and shamefully mistreated them and even killed them. This infuriated the king, so he sent his soldiers to execute those murderers and had their city burned to the ground. The king said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, yet those who had been invited to attend didn't deserve the honor. Now I want you to go into the streets and the alleyways and invite anyone and everyone you find to come and enjoy the wedding feast in the honor of my son. Wow. Now that you're a Christian, I guess it's pretty easy to see what he's talking about here, right? The people who were invited to the feast were the Pharisees. They didn't see it as a feast because it was too hard. The G-force just knocked them out. Too hard for them to understand that this is my calling to go to tax collectors and sinners. And yet these people, Jesus said, are entering the kingdom before you. So now... He says, go out to the alleys, the highways and the byways, and find those and bring them. How many, how many of you were found in a highway or a byway? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? If we told the stories of how ruined our lives were because of the sin, and that he never, uh, he chased me down. He fights till I'm found. He leaves the 99. It's a reckless love. He, he took a chance to come and find me in the mess that I was in. And, and nobody is too far away from him that he won't reach them. The worst sin is not too hard for God. It's so exciting to me. So I want you to go into the streets and the alleyways and invite anyone and everyone you find to come and enjoy the wedding feast in honor of my son. So the servants went out into the city and invited everyone to come to the wedding feast, good and bad alike, until the banquet hall was what? crammed with people. Now the king entered the banquet hall and he looked with glee over all his guests. Just spend a minute there. He's looking at all of us here and he remembers where we were when he found us and he's looking at us with glee right now and he's saying, you know what? You dress up pretty nice. Yeah. 
Even the baby agreed with that. <laughs> Unbelievable what the transition is in our lives. And now we're at the wedding. But then there's this difficult part to understand. Then he noticed a guest who was not wearing the wedding robe that was provided for him. Now, this is the Passion Translation, and not every verse says it that way in other translations, but it's an important thing. It says the wedding garment that was provided for him. So we are given a wedding garment on the way in. There's a certain way we're expected to behave when we're in the kingdom, right? So you don't just get in and now you keep on sinning and just do whatever you want, anything goes. No, that makes the father unhappy. You were invited, but there's a certain set of rules and standards for your good, not just because he's mean and he wants to restrict us. Because the next part is hard to understand, isn't it? He said, my friend, how is it that you're here and you're not wearing what? Your wedding garment. But the man was speechless. And then the king turned to his servants and said, tell him, I'm sorry, tie him up and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be great sorrow with weeping and grinding of teeth. So look, this doesn't mean that God's a mean God. It means that there's a, a minimum standard that he needs us to live up to as his sons and his daughters. That's not a bad thing, okay? You call yourself a Christian. You're not perfect. It doesn't mean you're never going to sin again. But David was a man after God's own heart. See, so all of us can be men and women that are after God's heart. If you know that you're intentionally living with a sin and in a sinful relationship and say, well, the grace of God is that he has to just forgive me, that will be an example of not wearing the garment and saying, no, I'm sorry. The reason this kingdom matters is because there are boundaries that he gives us and that by living within those boundaries, you flourish. If you try to knock down all the boundaries, then you're not in his kingdom. So you've got to wear his garment. And look, I'm not getting legalistic about it. It's in the word. What else, what else would it be in here for? Not to show you that he's mean. It's that, look, this is a war that we're in. And we can't go lightly. We can't be halfway Christians. We've got to be either all in or not in. And, and all in for all of us just means a man and woman after God's own heart. All right. For everyone invited to enter in. I'm sorry. Everyone is invited to enter in, but few respond in excellence. <laughs> That's like wide is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the road that leads to life, and few there are that find it. It's few, relatively speaking. We all found it. But I think part of this mystery of the kingdom is that he's still trying to keep showing us you can go higher. Yeah. I'm at the next level of the scaffolding, and I want to hand you the next tool. And that's why his hand's reaching down to pull you up to another level. Not a condemning word. And I want to take you higher. Yeah. I'm a sly in the family stone. Wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Redeem me, Lord. Redeem me. <laughs> I won't say it, I promise. So we're going to end here. This is Romans chapter 11. I referred to it earlier. And it can be a little bit intimidating. You know, the book of Romans can be a little bit intimidating, can it? You try to read the book of Hebrews and say, wow, there's a whole lot of stuff in there I didn't get the first time through. But that's the depth and the riches of God. He wants to show you things. And stay hungry for the word. And this says, oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom, and the knowledge of God. How inscrutable are his judgments, how unsearchable are his ways. Granted, you don't hear that word very often, inscrutable. But it's trying to measure that God is so big, you can't really say he's impossible to understand. It's, it's just that he's so big, it's hard for us to comprehend how big he is. But every time you go up another level, you get another notch of understanding, another dimension of his character. So why would we want to live down in the swamp when he wants to pull us up higher? And each one of us has a different swamp that's appealing to us or that we're vulnerable to. We were with somebody yesterday and they were talking about how so many more women now are getting tested for a certain gene. And if they have a gene for breast cancer, they're taking action before there's ever even a sign of that in their body. And you start to wonder, like, wow, at some point, is this like going too far? And, and, and like, no, but maybe we're going to find out someday that, that it was predictable, that there's a predisposition. And maybe in my family it was because there was a lot of sexual sin and I got an inherited thing. And that's, that's what they were talking about from South Africa, right? Those illegal spiritual transactions that happened generations ago 
that the enemy is still using as a charge against me. It's got to be broken. Break that thing off and elevate it to a whole higher level. Because the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. Remember that song? Places I used to go, I don't want to go there anymore. Because I've been taken higher by the Lord. It's unsearchable, but it's not unknowable if you're hungry. I want to go deeper, Lord. Keep me hungry. Keep me looking for that arm. Keep me reaching up for your arm. I don't want to be a couch potato spiritually. Or just, look, I'm not against video games, but they've become an obsession for some people. Like, there's so much good word. There's so much, even our own channel. Just go on our YouTube channel. There's so many good videos you can watch that will nourish you and feed you and introduce you to concepts you might not have thought of. It's free. How much easier could it be? You don't even need Wi-Fi. It's free. And just feed on it and feed on it. Most of them are 10 minutes, not even longer than 10 minutes. You can do it on the way to the grocery store. And it's like, oh, I just got a little tidbit. I just got another nugget of truth. I just took a snack in the spirit. And sometimes the, the, the stories just have a way of the staying power. There's certain teachers that just have this ability to paint a picture with their words, and it just stays with you. And even there, different speakers you know, minister to different people, but find that source of strength for you. We've never lived in a better time to be fed or a more distracting time to keep us from being fed. So you have to decide how you're going to spend your time. And then, um, just to finish again, Romans 11, 34, he's actually, the next verse is quoting Isaiah 40. And it said, Who has known the mind of the Lord, and who has been his counselor? So you get the point there, right? Like, don't ever think that you know it all. Because none of us know the mind of the Lord. None of us have been his counselor. And then Job even turns it up another whole notch because then he quotes Job 41 and says, who has ever given God anything and made him pay it back, <laughs> right? And if you go unpack Job 41 a little bit, it's like, really, you know, you are either going to fall on the rock or the rock is going to fall on you. You better remember who you're talking to. This is God. And he gives us this privilege of being in a father-to-son, father-to-daughter relationship with him. And he wants to speak to us. Don't be surprised if it's a little confusing at first. He speaks in parables. I'll end with this. And this is one of the Bill Johnson stories that I never forgot. Now, we don't believe in the Easter Bunny here, okay? We don't practice that as a church. But he used the example, and he said, look, let's just say you're at Grandma's house, and all the kids are there, and they're doing an Easter egg hunt. You would hide the eggs in different places based on what age group you're trying to hide them from, right? So a two-year-old... You could put it right on the coffee table. And the two-year-old would come in and go, oh, I found the egg, even though it wasn't even hidden. But if the 14-year-old came in and saw it on there, like, oh, please, you're insulting me. I want it to be in the top drawer on the fourth shelf in the back closet inside a sock. You know, I want to need a prophetic word to find that thing. Because we all need to be challenged, Right? That's the thing. So everybody's at a different level, but we all need to keep on being nourished. You just can't ever arrive at this place. And when you compare who our benchmark is, it's God. So how haughty would you have to be to think that you know everything there is to know about the Bible? That's the mystery of the kingdom. There's always going to be another level to take you higher. Let's stand, because this is a really good little parting verse. Romans 11, verse 36. We used to sing a song, and this was the uh, chorus of the song. Maybe we'll do it again. Can we say it out loud together? Romans eleven thirty six, Or, I'm sorry, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. One more time. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. So let's just do a prophetic act. Reach up. And it says, from him and through him. So pull it down. And then to him, you give it back, are all things. It's from him, through him, and then to him are all things. That's how you climb up this ladder. From him, through him, to him. See, and it starts to sound like an engine after a while. And I'm going up another level. And he keeps handing me another tool. And he's taking me higher. And the swamp is looking less and less attractive. And we notice something down at the Jersey Shore. The higher up you go, there's no bugs. Amen. Amen, hallelujah. No mosquitoes. 
You're away from the swamp. Yeah. And all the things that bug you when you were in the swamp, man, you know, you're just not, not going to be bothered with that stuff anymore. Your immune system is so strong. So, Lord, I, I just want to bless you. Just lift them. Okay, Lord, I just thank you for your people that are here. They're so, such sponges, such hungry people that want to learn, that want to know your word, that want to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But you said there's a mystery to us. It's been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. And Lord, we just believe that there's always more that you can show us. Can you say it with me? Keep me hungry, Lord. I want more of you. I don't want to be satisfied. I want to move higher in you. Not just today, but every day for the rest of my life. Drain the swamp and get me higher into that atmosphere where I know your ways and I know your nature. In Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to say a prayer. It could be somebody here who's never accepted the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior. Maybe somebody invited you to come to church today and this is new to you, but it would be a shame for us not to give you an opportunity because it's not a difficult prayer. You just make a prayer of invitation and you say, Lord, I heard about this. It sounds intriguing to me. I don't fully understand it, but something's going on on my inside and I know I need to take action. I need to do something about what's happening in my heart right now. So what we do is we just say a prayer, and we invite the Lord in, and we ask him to come. So if you could just close your eyes, we'll say the prayer out loud together, okay? Could you do that with me, church? How many have said this prayer? Make noise, make noise. Okay. So it's not the first time. So close your eyes, let's pray, so nobody feels embarrassed. We're not trying to point you out. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I've heard about your love today in a way that I didn't know about it before. And I want to open my heart to you. There's a lot I don't understand. But I know that there's sin in my life. And I can't forgive myself. But that you can forgive me. Because of what Jesus did. By going to the cross. Taking my place. Taking my punishment. And then rising from the dead. To give me life. I surrender to you now. I apologize to you. For the sinful life I've lived. I need your power to help me turn from that life so that I can turn away from sin and turn towards you. I open my arms to you, Lord, to be my Father, to be my God, to be my Lord. I walk away from sin, and I walk into relationship with you. Jesus, I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Spirit. Empower me to serve you. Today, tomorrow, all the days of my life, and then to spend eternity with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you said that prayer for the first time, could you lift your hand? Anybody here say it for the first time? If you would... Could you come forward? Would you come up to the altar? Because there's something about making a public declaration when you, when you say a prayer like this that, lets, that makes a statement. It makes a statement. Stretch your hand towards these folks, okay? See, it makes a statement when you step out of your seat. And you say, I'm, I'm leaving that other life behind and I'm coming and stepping forward. I don't know what the whole thing means, but I know that where I was is not going to get me where I want to go. Amen. And this new life is the best thing that could ever happen. Now remember, the seed got four different soils. So they are seed now. And we want the seed of the word to fall into their heart on good ground, right? So you just look at who they are and you pray for them. That, that the seed of the word of God is going to fall on good ground that the devil has no place in their lives, that he's not going to come like some bird and steal it. No, no. This seed falls on good ground. So, Lord, we just lift these two up before you right now. We thank you for their lives. We thank you for their courage, for their willingness to step out of that seat and <laughs> say, I'm going forward. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Lord, we just seal your promises into their lives right now. We ask you to fill them and empower them with your spirit 
that they might do what we said, Lord, serve you for the rest of their lives and for eternity be with you. And we covenant as a church to come around them and support them and to be here for them, to help guide them, to help feed them. You told Peter, if he loved you, feed my sheep. Lord, we thank you that more have come into the flock today and that they will be well-fed sheep in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to God.